Chapter 47 Mrs. Dashwood did not hear unmoved the vindication of her former favourite. She rejoiced in his being cleared from some part of his imputed guilt. She was sorry for him. She wished him happy. But the feelings of the past could not be recalled. Nothing could restore him with a faith unbroken, a character unblemished to Marianne. Nothing could do away the knowledge of what the latter had suffered, through his means, nor remove the guilt of his conduct towards Eliza. Nothing could replace him, therefore, in her former esteem, nor injure the interests of Colonel Brandon. Had Mrs. Dashwood, like her daughter, heard Willoughby's story from himself, had she witnessed his distress, and been under the influence of his countenance and his manner, it was probable that her compassion would have been greater. But it was neither in Eleanor's power nor in her wish to rouse such feelings in another, by her, de by her detailed explanation, as had at first been called forth in herself. Reflection had given calmness to her judgment and sobered her, own sobered her own opinion of Willoughby's deserts. She wished, therefore, to declare only the simple truth and lay open such facts as were really due his to his character without any embellishment of tenderness to lead the fancy astray. In the evening, when they were all three together, Marianne began voluntarily to speak of him again. But that it was not without effort, the restless, unquiet thoughtfulness in which she had been for some time previously sitting, her rising colour as she spoke, and her unsteady voice plainly showed. I wish to assure you both, she said, that I see everything, as you can desire me to do. Mrs. Dashwood would have interrupted her instantly with soothing tenderness had not Eleanor, who really wished to hear her sister's unbiased opinion, by an eager sign engaged her silence. Marianne slowly continued. It is a great relief to me, what Eleanor told me this morning. I have now heard exactly what I wish to hear. For some moments her voice was lost, but recovering herself she added, and with greater calmness than before, I am now perfectly satisfied. I wish for no change. I never could have been happy with him, after knowing, as sooner or later I must have known, all this. I should have had no confidence, no esteem. Nothing could have done it away to my feelings. I know it. I know it, cried her mother. Happy with a man of libertine practices. With one who had so injured the peace of the dearest of our friends and the best of men. No, my Marianne has not a heart to be made happy with such a man. Her conscience, her sensitive conscience, would have felt all that the conscience of her husband ought to have felt. Marianne sighed and repeated, I wish for no change. You consider the matter, said Eleanor, exactly as a good mind and a sound understanding must consider it. And I dare say you perceive as well as myself, not only in this, but in many other circumstances, reason enough to be convinced that your marriage must have involved you in many certain troubles and disappointments in which you would have been poorly supported by affection on his side, much less certain. Had you married, you must have been always poor. His expensiveness is acknowledged even by himself, and his whole conduct declares that self-denial is a word hardly understood by him. His demands and your inexperience together on a small, very small, income must have brought on distresses, which would not be the less grievous to you from having been entirely unknown and unthought of before. Your sense of honour and honesty would have led you, I know, when aware of your situation, to attempt all the economy that would appear to you possible. And perhaps, as long as your frugality retrenched only on your own comfort, you might have been suffered to practice it. But beyond that, and how little could the utmost of your single management do to stop the ruin which had begun before your marriage? Beyond that, had you endeavoured, however reasonably, to abridge his enjoyments, is it not to be feared that instead of prevailing on feelings so selfish to consent to it, you would have lessened your own influence on his heart and made him regret the connection which had involved him in such difficulties? Marianne's lips quivered. She repeated the word, selfish? In a tone that implied, do you really think him selfish? The whole of his behaviour, replied Eleanor. From the beginning to the end of the affair has been grounded on selfishness. It was selfishness which first made him sport with your affections, 
which afterwards, when his own were engaged, made him delay the confession of it, and which finally carried him from Barton. His own enjoyment, or his own ease, was in every particular his ruling principle. It is very true. My happiness was never his object. At present, continued Eleanor, he regrets what he has done. And why does he regret it? Because it finds it has not answered towards himself. It has not made him happy. His circumstances are now embarrassed. He suffers from no evil of that kind, and he thinks only that he has married a woman of a less amiable temper than yourself. But does it thence follow that had he married you, he would have been happy? The inconveniences would have been different. He would then have suffered under, under the pecuniary distress, which, because they are removed, he now reckons as nothing. He would have had a wife of whose temper he could make no complaint. But he would have been always necessitous, always poor, and probably would soon have learned to rank the innumerable comforts of a clear estate and good income as a far more importance even to domestic happiness than the mere temper of a wife. I have not a doubt of it, said Marianne, and I have nothing to regret nothing but my own folly. Rather say your mother's imprudence, my child, said Mrs. Dashwood. She must be answerable. Marianne would not let her proceed, and Eleanor, satisfied that each felt their own error, wished to avoid any survey of the past that might weaken her sister's spirits. She therefore, pursuing the first subject, immediately continued, One observation may, I think, be fairly drawn from the whole of the story that all Willoughby's difficulties have arisen from the first offence against virtue in his behaviour toward Eliza Williams. That crime has been the origin of every lesser one and of all his present discontents. Marianne assented most feelingly to the remark, and her mother was led by it to an enumeration of Colonel Brandon's injuries and merits, warm as friendship and design could unitedly dictate. Her daughter did not look, however, as if much of it were heard by her. Eleanor, according to her expectation, saw on the two or three following days that Marianne did not continue to gain strength as she had done. But while her, but while her resolution was unsubdued and she still tried to appear cheerful and easy, her older sister could safely trust to the effect of time upon her health. Margaret returned, and the family were again all restored to each other, again quietly settled at the cottage, and if not pursuing their usual studies with quite so much vigour as when they first came to Barton, at least planning a vigorous prosecution of them in future. Eleanor grew impatient for some tidings of Edward. She had heard nothing of him since her leaving London. Nothing new of his plans. Nothing certain even of his present abode. Some letters had passed between her and her brother, in consequence of Marianne's illness, and in the first of John's there had been this sentence. We know nothing of our unfortunate Edward, and can make no inquiries on so prohibited a subject, but conclude him to be still at Oxford, which was all the intelligence of Edward afforded her by the correspondence, for his name was not even mentioned in any of the succeeding letters. She was not doomed, however, to be long in ignorance of his measures. Their manservant had been sent one morning to Exeter on business, and when, as he waited at table, he had satisfied the inquiries of his mistress as to the event of his errand. This was his voluntary communication. I suppose you know, ma'am, that Mr. Ferris is married. Marianne gave a violent start, fixed her eyes upon Eleanor, saw her turning pale, and fell back in her chair in hysterics. Mrs. Dashwood, whose eyes, as she answered the servant's inquiry, had intuitively taken the same direction, was shocked to perceive by Eleanor's countenance how much she really suffered and in a moment afterwards a light distress by Marianne's situation knew not on which child to bestow her principal attention. The servant, who saw only that Miss Marianne was taken ill, had sense enough to call one of the maids, who, with Mrs. Dashwood's assistance, supported her into the other room. By that time, Marianne was rather better, and her mother, leaving her to the care of Margaret and the maid, returned to Eleanor, who, though still much disordered, had so far recovered the use of her reason and voice as to be just beginning to inquire of Thomas, as to the source of his intelligence. Mrs. Dashwood immediately took all that trouble on herself, and Eleanor had the be benefit of the information without the exertion of seeking it. Who told you that Mr. Ferris was married, Thomas? I see Mr. Ferris myself, ma'am, this morning in Exeter, and his lady too, Miss Steele, as was. They was stopping in a chase at the door of the new London Inn, as I went there with a message from Sally at the park to her brother, who was one of the postboys. I happened to look up as I went by the chase, and so I see directly it was the youngest Miss Steele, so I took off my hat, 
and she knew me and called to me and inquired after you, ma'am, and the young ladies, especially Miss Marianne, and bid me I should give her compliments and Mr. Ferris's, their best compliments and service, and how sorry they had not time to come on and see you. But they was in a great hurry to go forwards, for they was going further down for a little while. But however, when they came back, they'd make sure to come and see you. But did she tell you she was married, Thomas? Yes, ma'am. She smiled and said how she had changed her name since she was in these parts. She was always a very affable and free-spoken young lady and very civil behaved, so I made free to wish her joy. Was Mr. Ferris in the carriage with her? Yes, ma'am. I just see him leaning back in it, but he did not look up. He never was a gentleman much for talking. Eleanor's heart could easily account for his not putting himself forward, and Mrs. Dashwood probably found the same explanation. Was there no one else in the carriage? No, ma'am, only they two. Do you know where they came from? They came straight from town, as Miss Lucy, Mrs. Ferris, told me. And are they going farther westward? Yes, ma'am, but not to bide long. They'll soon be back again, and they'd be sure and call here. Mrs. Dashwood now looked at her daughter. But Eleanor knew better than to expect them. She recognised the whole of Lucy in the message, and was very confident that Edward would never come near them. She observed in a low voice to her mother that they were probably going down to Mr. Pratt's near Plymouth. Thomas's intelligence seemed over. Eleanor looked as if she wished to hear more. Did you see them off before you came away? No, ma'am. The horses was just coming out, but I could not bide any longer. I was afraid of being late. Did Mrs. Ferris look well? Yes, ma'am. She said how she was very well, and to my mind she was always a very handsome young lady, and she seemed vastly contented. Mrs. Dashwood could think of no other question, and Thomas and the tablecloth, now alike needless, were soon afterwards dismissed. Mary had, Mary Ann had already sent to say that she should eat nothing more. Mrs. Dashwood's and Eleanor's appetites were equally lost, and Margaret might think herself very well off that with so much uneasiness as both her sisters had lately experienced, so much reason that they had often to be careless of their meals, she had never been obliged to go without her dinner before. When the dessert and the wine were arranged and Mrs. Dashwood and Eleanor were left by themselves, they remained long together in a similar in a similarity of thoughtfulness and silence. Mrs. Dashwood feared to hazard any remark, and ventured not to offer consolation. She now found that she had erred in relying on Eleanor's representation of herself, and justly concluded that everything had been expressly softened at that time to spare her from an increase of unhappiness. Suffering as she then had suffered for Marianne, she found that she had been misled by the careful the considerate attention of her daughter. To think the attachment, which once she had so well understood, much slighter in reality than she had been wont to believe, or than it was now proved to be. She feared that under this persuasion she had been unjust, inattentive, nay, almost unkind to her Eleanor, that Marianne's affliction, because more acknowledged, more immediately before her, had too much engrossed her tenderness, and led her away to forget that in Eleanor she might have a daughter suffering almost as much, certainly with less self-provocation and greater fortitude. <clears throat> Chapter 48 Eleanor now found the difference between the expectation of an unpleasant event, however certain the mind may be told to consider it, and certainty itself. She now found that in spite of herself, she had always admitted a hope, while Edward remained single, that something would occur to prevent his marrying Lucy, that some resolution of his own, some mediation of friends, or some more eligible opportunity of establishment for the lady, would arise to assist the happiness of all. But he was now married, and she condemned her heart for the lurking flattery which so much heightened the pain of the intelligence. That he should be married so soon, before, as she imagined, he could be in orders, and consequently, before he could be in possession of the living, surprised her a little at first. But she soon saw how likely it was that Lucy, in her self-provident care, in her haste to secure him, should overlook everything but the risk of delay. They were married, married in town and now hastening down to her uncle's. What had Edward felt on being within four miles of Barton? on seeing her mother's servant, on hearing Lucy's message. They would soon, she supposed, be settled at Delaford. Delaford, 
that place in which so much conspired to give her an interest, which she wished to be acquainted with and yet desired to avoid. She saw them in an instant in their parsonage house, saw in Lucy the active, contriving manager, uniting at once a desire of smart appearance with the utmost frugality, and ashamed to be suspected of half her economical practices, pursuing her own interest in every thought, courting the favour of Colonel Brandon, of Mrs. Jennings, and of every wealthy friend. In Edward she knew not what she saw, nor what she wished to see. Happy or unhappy, nothing pleased her. She turned away her head from every sketch of him. Eleanor flattered herself that someone of their connections in London would write to them to announce the event and give further particulars. But day after day passed off and brought no letters, no tidings. Though uncertain that anyone were to blame, she found fault with every absent friend. They were all thoughtless or indolent. When do you write to Colonel Brandon, ma'am? was an inquiry which sprung from the impatience of her mind to have something going on. I wrote to him, my love, last week, and rather expect to see than to hear from him again. I earnestly pressed him coming to us, and should not be surprised to see him walk in today or tomorrow or any day. This was gaining something, something to look forward to. Colonel Brandon must have some information to give. Scarcely had she so determined it when the figure of a man on horseback drew her eyes to the window. He stopped at their gate. It was a gentleman. It was Colonel Brandon himself. Now she should hear more, and she trembled in expectation of it. But it was not Colonel Brandon. Neither his air nor his height. Were it possible? She should say it must be Edward. She looked again. He had just dismounted. She could not be mistaken. It was Edward. She moved away and sat down. He comes from Mr. Pratt's purposely to see us. I will be calm. I will be mistress of myself. In a moment, she perceived that the others were likewise aware of the mistake. She saw her mother and Marianne change colour, saw them look at herself and whisper a few sentences to each other. She would have given the world to be able to speak and to make them understand that she hoped no coolness, no slight, would appear in their behaviour to him. But she had no utterance and was obliged to leave all to their own discretion. Not a syllable passed aloud. They all waited in silence for the appearance of their visitor. His footsteps were heard along the gravel path. In a moment he was in the passage, and in another he was before them. His countenance, as he entered the room, was not too happy, even for Eleanor. His complexion was white with agitation, and he looked as if fearful of his reception and conscious that he merited no kind one. Mrs. Dashwood, however, conforming as she trusted to the wishes of that daughter, by whom she then meant in the warmth of her heart to be guided in everything, met him with a look of forced complacency, gave him her hand, and wished him joy. He coloured, and stammered out an unintelligible reply. Eleanor's lips had moved with her mother's, and when the moment of action was over, she wished that she had shaken hands with him too. But it was then too late, and with a countenance meaning to be open, she sat down again and talked of the weather. Marianne had treated as much as possible out of sight. Marianne had retreated as much as possible out of sight to conceal her distress, and Margaret, understanding some part but not the whole of the case, thought it incumbent on her to be dignified, and therefore took a seat as far from him as she could and maintained a strict silence. When Eleanor had ceased to rejoice in the dryness of the season, a very awful pause took place. It was put an end to by Mrs. Dashwood, who felt obliged to hope that he had left Mrs. Ferris very well. In a hurried manner, he replied in the affirmative. Another pause. Eleanor, resolving to exert herself, though fearing the sound of her own voice, now said, Is Mrs. Ferris at Longstaple? At Longstaple, he replied, with an air of surprise. No, my mother is in town. I meant, said Eleanor, taking up some work from the table, to inquire after Mrs. Edward Ferris. She dared not look up, but her mother and Marianne both turned their eyes on him. He coloured, seemed perplexed, looked doubtingly, and after some hesitation said, Perhaps you mean my brother, you mean Mrs. Mrs. Robert Ferris. Mrs. Robert Ferris was repeated by Marianne and her mother in an accent of the utmost amazement. 
And though Eleanor could not speak, even her eyes were fixed on him with the same impatient wonder. He rose from his seat and walked to the window, apparently from not knowing what to do, took up a pair of scissors that lay there, and while spoiling both them and their sheath by cutting the latter to pieces, as he spoke, said in a hurried voice, Perhaps you do not know, you may not have heard, that my brother is lately married to to the youngest, to Miss Lucy Steele. His words were echoed with unspeakable astonishment by all but Eleanor, who sat with her head leaning over her work in a state of such agitation as made her be as made her hardly know where she was. Yes, said he. They were married last week and are now at Dawlish. Eleanor could sit no longer. She almost ran out of the room, and as soon as the door was closed, burst into tears of joy, which at first she thought would never cease. Edward, who had till then looked anywhere rather than at her, saw her hurry away and perhaps saw or even heard her emotion for immediately afterwards he fell into a reverie which no remarks, no inquiries, no, no affectionate address of Mrs. Dashwood could penetrate, and at last, without saying a word, quitted the room, and walked out towards the village, leaving the others in the greatest astonishment and perplexity on a change in his situation, so wonderful and so sudden, a perplexity which they had no means of lessening but by their own conjectures.'